This video is sponsored by Grassroots Harm Reduction. Have you ever been smoking a ton of darts after your wife left you because you bet the house on a shitty parlay and now she's with the dude she told you not to worry about? Now you're totally depressed, no will to live, and you're cranking your hog to some questionable furry erotica in place of your former wife. Ah, uh, like totally not me either. Well, good thing we're making a compound called Bupropion HCL, also known as Wellbutrin. This is actually a compound used for smoking cessation, ADHD treatment, and is a atypical antidepressant, which inhibits the reuptake of noradrenaline and dopamine compared to more common antidepressants, such as SSRIs. By preventing the reuptake, bupropion, or Wellbutrin, increases the levels of these neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft, leading to enhanced signaling and improved mood. So when things go bad, you can at least have an artificial happiness. So, as a doomsday prepper would, I thought that I must make this drug in my backyard shed in case this ever happens to me. I mean, it, it really could, I don't know. I suddenly have the urge to hit parlays and start smoking. This is not looking good, guys. Now, the original methodology that I had for this was actually going to be a green synthesis, and this was a paper that I found a while ago. Now, we have to do a bromination, and the green synthesis used NBS, while the, well, non-green synthesis just used bromine. Now, I have done the actual green synthesis before, and NBS works perfectly fine. The only problem that I had was at the end. I had to do a vacuum distillation, and my vacuum's not that good, and my heating mantle kind of got out of control, and, well, I destroyed the product. And the worst part is Sam from Chemiolis actually gave me Sirene, which is a very hard reagent to get, and unfortunately, the synthesis failed. I want to make sure he gets a shout out for that, just because it's kind of an annoying reagent to get. So make sure to go check his channel out. But if I follow the non-green synthesis, there's no vacuum distillation, and it's much faster. So in other words, fuck the environment, and we're doing the non-green synthesis way. Which just means we're going to use bromine, DCM, and NMP. Now, I don't have bromine willingly on hand, so we're going to need to make it. So to do this, we're going to add 43.23 grams of sodium bromide into a 500 milliliter round bottom boiling flask. We're then going to add 50 grams of sodium persulfate into the flask as well. Then all I have to do is just add 50 milliliters of distilled water and I'm pretty much set to go. I don't need a large amount of bromine and I'm really not going to store this bromine, so we're just going to make a small amount. If you're interested where I got this method, I actually took this from Experimental Chemistry as he left a comment a long time ago on one of my old bromine videos and said to use this method, so I gave it a shot. So make sure to go check him out. I also found a really cool orange stir bar that I had, so I used that for the bromine. You know, because it's the same color. All I have to do with this method is just do a simple distillation with the receiving flask in an ice bath. I also had a gas washing bottle for my safety and that contained potassium carbonate and sodium thiosulfate. Elemental bromine is pretty dangerous, so it's important to have safety. Speaking of safety, it's sponsor time. I'm excited to highlight a sponsor that's making a big difference in harm reduction and drug safety, the Grassroots Harm Reduction Network. They sent me this complete set of drug checking reagent kits and some fentanyl test strips, and I'll show you how they work in just a bit. But first, let's talk about why this is so important. Now, if you're consuming a substance, knowing what you're actually taking is an extremely important part of keeping you safe. Drug testing reagents and fentanyl test strips makes this possible, offering a simple and effective way to verify what's in front of you. They are essential tools for making informed decisions in prioritizing your well-being. While they did send me every reagent necessary to test the vast majority of substances you might encounter, here's what comes in the LSD test kit, and that is the Hoffman and Ehrlich reagent which is extremely useful when you're deciding to try these types of substances. Safety is number one priority. And the best part is that Grassroots Harm Reduction has everything on their website, so you have no guesswork. Believe me, they have a lot of information. I also want to show one of the reagent test kits in action, and I'm going to do the Marquise and Freuda reagent kit. I may have butchered that last name. Now, I decided to test the aspirin that I made for my second video ever on this channel. And as you can see, we have these color charts that can tell us what the aspirin color should be. Now, as we wait for these colors to appear, let me tell you a little bit more about Grassroots Harm Reduction Network's mission. Now, what's great about the Grassroots Harm Reduction Network is that they aren't just selling these kits. They're a nonprofit organization that supports community-based harm reduction efforts across the US. 
The proceeds from every sale go directly towards providing material support to small, independent harm reduction organizations working on the front lines in their communities. The best part is that Grassroots offers these kits at the lowest price you'll find anywhere. Their goal is to make harm reduction tools accessible to everyone, not to just those who can afford premium prices. As someone who recognizes the importance of harm reduction, I love seeing organizations like this doing really good work. It's more than just selling products. It's about fostering safer communities and empowering individuals. And to bring it back to our test, you can see that our aspirin from the Marquise is this beautiful pink, and from our Freud or Freuda, it's this beautiful purpley color, indicating that we have aspirin. If you want to get your hands on these reagents, head to grassrootsharmreduction.org. You can use code KIMDELIC at checkout to get 10% off your order. Every purchase helps fund harm reduction efforts and keeps these tools accessible for everyone. And just as a closing statement, I do know someone personally from this company. They put in a lot of hard work for this, and I actually genuinely like their product, so it's really important to support this. After cranking the heat up, we can see that there's a color change in the flask. We can also see that my stir bar is doing jack shit. After some time, we do start to see the formation of bromine. We can also see the deadly red vapor slowly make its way through the condenser, and I definitely didn't breathe this in. It's such a beautiful element. But really, really deadly. Good thing the gas scrubber is working, otherwise I'd be lying right next to the mouth pipetters. Soon enough, we have our condensed liquid bromine entering the receiving flask. Bromine is a very dense liquid, and when it condenses, it always reminds me of this blood-like rain, and it's really cool to watch. Now, there will be some water coming over with it, this is perfectly fine, and we can separate this with the separatory funnel once we're finished. It did take quite some time, but eventually, the red color from the bromine and the gaseous bromine did start to diminish, and it wasn't as red as before. All this means is that the reaction is pretty much done, and we're ready to move on to the next step. All that's left to do is now just separate the bromine from the bromine water. Now, the technique of this is quite an easy technique. The only problem is we're working with bromine, so we gotta be extra careful. Now, for the reaction that we're doing, we need a one molar solution of bromine in DCM. So, I'm just going to gather the bromine and weigh it out and then pour it into some DCM. Now, I already calculated what I need, so I'll share that in a little bit. I don't particularly care what the yield is for this. All I know is that I have enough for my reaction. And to make our one molar bromine in DCM, I need 3.196 grams of bromine and 20 milliliters of DCM. I also don't know if the weigh boat would do any protection for my scale, but I felt better with it on there. In a perfectly executed motion, I poured the bromine into the DCM. Usually I spill things when I pour, so I was pretty happy with this. Now that all the prep work is done, we can actually start the reaction. 3.992 grams of m propiophenone was added to a flask. 20 milliliters of DCM was then added so everything could dissolve. I also got a clean stir bar for this one, not the orange one, and I threw that in there. Now, we are doing a bromination, so it's pretty important that everything is mixed together first. I then put a separatory funnel at the top, and I'm going to fill this with our one molar bromine solution. The reason that we're going to use this is we need to add this drop by drop, and then wait for something very specific to happen. What we're looking for is the disappearance of the color of bromine. This will kickstart the reaction, and what we need to do is add a few drops and then slightly heat it up. Now, to do this, all I did was hit it with my heat gun very briefly to just warm it up a little bit. From the many videos that I watched about this synthesis, it should happen pretty fast. Yeah, so nothing fucking happened, and the color didn't go away. If this doesn't work, I'm about to go hit a parlay and go buy a pack of cigarettes. I was thinking about it, and I think I just added too much of the bromine solution in there. So I restarted the entire thing. When I did it again, I only put a couple drops in, and you can see the color slowly disappear, and it goes clear. This is a very good sign, as the reaction is working. Oh wait, hold on. You guys hear that? It's mechanism time. The mechanism starts with initiation, and this is where our bromine is cleaved by heat or light, in our case it's heat, creating two bromine radicals. 
Next is propagation, where one of the bromine radicals reacts with a hydrogen atom from our m chloropropylphenone creating a carbon radical and HBr. This newly formed carbon radical then reacts with another Br2 molecule to form our product and another bromine radical which can continue the chain. And this is our product here. Now we also have termination and the reaction ends when two radicals combine forming a stable product which in our case could be our product at the end or any other impurity. I tested it further by adding in more of the bromine solution and the color does seem to go away shortly after a couple of seconds. Once confirmation was present, I could now move on to the next step. And all it was, was to put this into an ice bath and then slowly drip in the bromine solution. As you can see again, every single time it dripped in, the color would almost immediately go away and it became more of a light yellowish solution. You know, there's a wide variety of sexual fantasies and mine is when a chemical reaction works. I also realized just now editing that I was actually supposed to use 24 milliliters of a one molar bromine solution. I only used 20 milliliters, so my yields will probably not be good. Anyway, this is all done. Now, this intermediate is a lacrimator, so fumigation is probably a good idea. The next step is to remove the DCM by just a simple distillation. Now, my stir bar also decided to stop working randomly, so it's just going to be a boiling chip for now. But this is what it looks like when it's in the flask. Pretty boring if you ask me. Once things started to get hot and heavy in there, the DCM started to boil and it started to collect over. When most of the DCM was gone, it almost looked like this orangish oil that was left over. I also let this run a little bit longer just to get all the DCM out. In total, I had about 40 milliliters of DCM that we received back. When the intermediate was all cooled down, I added 20 milliliters of tert butylamine and it immediately smoked. Thank God for fumigation. Once I cleared all the fumes, I added 20 milliliters of NMP. And this is just going to be the solvent that we're using, and you can immediately see that all that cloudy white stuff is now being dissolved. While I was waiting for everything to dissolve, I also got a hot water bath ready for use. Though, the water bath needs to be 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Once the temperature was ready, I then put it into the beaker, and we're set to bake it for about 10 minutes. Over the course of about 10 to 15-ish minutes, we can see a color change slowly start to happen. I spun the box again, and we do have another mechanism, so let's go over that. Now, the mechanism for this one is pretty simple. Likely, it's an SN2 reaction, as we are using an aprotic solvent. Tert-butylamine will act as a nucleophile, and it will kick the bromine leaving group out. Now, either tert-butylamine or NMP, which is the solvent, will take one of the protons, stopping that positive charge from being on the nitrogen, and we get our product, bupropion. Now, we are turning this into the hydrochloride salt, so we will use HCl and isopropyl alcohol to do so, but I'm just going to give you the mechanism now, which is just throwing it in there, and the salt forms. The contents of the flask was then put into a separatory funnel, as our final product should be in it. What we need to do now is an extraction and a washing step. To start this, I'm going to add 100 milliliters of distilled water. After I poured the water in, it's almost like something precipitated out and it got extremely cloudy. We also see this rainfall of orange-like droplets that's going to the bottom of the separatory funnel. A magnificent scientific phenomenon that scratches that tism in our head. Also, shout out to Carolina Chemical for donating this bottle of diethyl ether. Good thing, because I hate distilling this shit. We're then going to do three 100 milliliter ether extractions to get our product into our ether layer and maybe a couple rags of ether, you know, just on the side. That was an ether intoxication joke in case you missed it. After shaking and venting, we can see that the ether layer is now a light orange color. Once I had all 300 milliliters of ether, I then washed that five times with five portions of 100 milliliters of water, and this is what we had left over. Now, since we washed this with water, we're going to need to dry this, as the ether likely pulled a little bit of water in. And for that, we're just going to use some simple sodium sulfate, and I put this onto a stir plate. I left it to stir for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then I came back to it, and it was a lot clearer. Now I just need to separate the ether and the sodium sulfate, so we're just going to use a cotton plug in a glass funnel. I know this looks advanced, but please make sure to just carefully pour the ether in so you don't spill like I do. And actually, as I edit this, it kind of looks like a nice martini, if you ask me. There's something about passing it through cotton that just makes you feel better, and it looks a lot cleaner. 
Now, all that's left to do is to make a 20 by 100 volume to volume 37% hydrochloric acid and isopropyl alcohol solution so we can crash this salt out. And this was the professional setup that I used. I also put this into an ice bath to further reduce the solubility as the salt forms, just in case. It also said it in the procedure. All I have to do is legit just drop this into the solution until it turns acidic on pH paper. And you can see as time goes on, the solution gets extremely cloudy and more opaque. And obviously we're making the salt version, so that's what you're seeing. When I first checked the pH, it wasn't where I wanted it to be, so I continued dropping in our acidic solution. I personally will overshoot the pH all the way down to the reddest pH that I can go. Now, you can kind of see on the edges the formation of these cloud-like structures, and that's the salt spinning around. It's a very good sign that something is happening. Honestly, I kind of just let it drop in there for a while, and you can see the formation of the hydrochloride salt in vast quantities. And when I checked the pH, we were pretty acidic, so I decided to stop. When I turn off the stirring, we can see a base layer of all this crystalline salt, and the ether looking pretty disgusting up there. Now, since I want the salt, I'm just going to filter this through two coffee filters, and that made it way easier than doing it any other way. I sped it up enough to where you'll watch it, and I slowed it down enough to where I can get more runtime. So this is kind of a win-win for both of us. Anyway, this is our final product of Bupropion HCl. Now, this isn't dry in any way, and we're going to need to dry this. As you can see, it's almost like a paste right now. Though, the good thing is that everything is purely white, and I don't see any color impurities. Which is really good, because having a different colored salt would be kind of an interesting experience. And, after I dried everything, this is what we're left with. Shockingly, we had a percent yield of 70.04%, with a yield of 4.58 grams. Now, the thing is, is, I don't really know what to do with this, as I don't have a use for it, so it's probably just going to collect dust in my shed. Perhaps I'll take up chain smoking to actually have a use for it. Now, I'm not going to taste this product as I'm not lab coats, and I really don't know what this is going to do as I don't know the purity of it. Though, so, 10 out of 10 would do the synthesis again.